thank you for having me here uh, in this interesting panel. Uh, uh, you talk about uh, perceptions of cyber threat, uh, and that's a super interesting uh, subject because uh, what seems to be the most apparent thing immediately is that uh, the, uh, the perception about the cyber threat, both at the uh, public uh, uh, opinion level and the policymaker level, institutional level, uh, is very weak, is very uh, uh, not, not adequate to the level of the threat. Um, uh, look, take 5G, of which uh, uh, Dr. Rulig uh, uh, talked. Uh, this is very symbolic. So let me let me uh, take these uh, these as a first uh, subject uh, to to enter into the the matter. Uh, uh, so 5G is very symbolic because on the one hand, um, uh, it represents exactly what we mean when we say the cyber threat and the cyber uh, threat in the supply chain, in the ICT supply chain. But on the other hand, we witness uh, this extraordinary ambiguity by policymakers in uh, struggling to decide what position to take. Uh, and we have seen that in the last few years in Europe, shall we accept or not accept the Chinese technologies for 5G, right? Uh, so what is the threat that we are discussing here? Dr. Rulig already mentioned it. Of course, it's the threat of espionage. If you control the 5G network, which will be the nervous system of our society that will be interconnecting, uh, you know, the political, the strategic, the military, the informative, the industrial, the economic uh, dimension, right? Uh, it's the nervous system that connects them all. Uh, and, and that enables a, a new generation of IoT, of big data, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, uh, you have this uh, extraordinary uh, risk that uh, a foreign power controlling this technology, <coughs> excuse me, taps into the network, understand what we do, uh, grasp information of, uh, of strategic relevance, uh, and, and so there is a classic risk of espionage. But then, of course, there is also the risk of sabotage if we depend uh, on a foreign power for accessing, for controlling our industrial system, for communicating and doing public order, uh, what happens, uh, or for controlling in, uh, critical infrastructure, uh, electric distribution, for instance, or civil aviation. Uh, what happens if a situation of crisis arises? Uh, uh, can we rely on the foreign power to continue providing these critical services? We have seen how the Chinese uh, uh, might be uh, coercive in nature. We have seen that with Lithuania, we see on many occasions, right? So this is a concrete risk. Uh, then there is also the risk of uh, cyber-enabled information warfare, the risk that this traffic is manipulated, that our perception are, uh, are manipulated through uh, bots, uh, through uh, the profiling that 5G uh, technologies will allow, right? Uh, 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 military strategists talk about the future individualization of warfare meaning that a foreign power can understand, can profile your citizens and can uh, uh, direct uh, manipulated information to alter perceptions to obtain a strategic goal. Yeah? And this is just the beginning because uh, artificial intelligence will uh, develop a whole new generation of uh, tools to manipulate perceptions. I think, for instance, uh, the threat of deep fake. Uh, what happens if uh, today a manipulated video of Mr. Putin declaring war on NATO uh, during the context of the Ukrainian crisis uh, uh, comes in the news? Uh, uh, we would all freak out, very honestly, right? Uh, and this is, this is something that we need to keep uh, very much into account. The risk also of, uh, as we can say, of a catalytic es uh, uh, escalation, meaning that a, a third party enters into a situation to disrupt uh, uh, an equilibrium which is there and that we are struggling to maintain. So, uh, uh, and, th and there is also another risk, if you allow me, uh, and this is the risk uh, which uh, would be there even if uh, the, the Chinese would be uh, uh, safe, secure, reliable, uh, playing uh, by the rules and so on and so forth, which is the risk that the Chinese would, or, or, or who provides this technology, uh, will have of uh, um, entering into our world, uh, catching data from uh, multiple billion, million users. And this data will uh, 
contribute to develop or even always better uh, algorithm yeah and and, and access uh, uh, and this is a critical element of the technological superiority right uh, because of course uh, uh, it will enable uh, uh, to be more uh, performative more effective uh, uh, in artificial intelligence development so uh, once again in, in profiling in automation and so on and, and, and so forth uh, 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 cyber was born as, as, a, as a domain to connect people across frontiers. It has become one of the most important uh, uh, battlefield uh, of the great power competition because, of course, uh, uh, of the issue of, uh, I would say, deniability mostly. You can do a lot of stuff without getting caught on the Internet. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, we are witnessing really, uh, and this is very apparent in 5G, a confrontation between two systems. And, and I, I totally concur with Dr. Rulig when he said uh, technology is not value free. Uh, uh, autocratic regimes uh, uh, consider uh, uh, the free flow of data as an intrinsic threat to their stability, as well as for the West, uh, uh, freedom of the internet, uh, openness of the internet uh, is a continuation of our fundamental rights uh, and civil liberties in the 21st century. So it's essential to what we are. It's at the core of our values of what we are. Uh, so if this is the paradigm, and this is, by the way, the reason why we decided uh, at the Italian Institute of International Political Studies to create in 2017 the Center on Cybersecurity, because we, pers we understand, uh, we want to investigate better how the dynamics that occur in cyberspace uh, impact international security and international politics, right? Uh, uh, if this is the paradigm that we have, why is it so difficult for Western governments to reject uh, Chinese technology, if these are the risks that we can see? And I would say, uh, coming back to your question, uh, uh, Teresa, the, the reason is, uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, it is a new Sputnik moment for us. Yeah, uh, The West is not used to have competitors in technology. Uh, we had uh, the Sputnik moment at the height of uh, our Cold War. Uh, we are coming back in that paradigm. Yeah, uh, the, the technological superiority, which has been historically been associated with the, 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 the hegemony of the West on the international system, is once again challenged, yeah, and and, and these uh, possibly uh, left our public opinions and uh, our policymakers uh, uh, shocked and unable to respond uh, uh, immediately. But then there is also other things. Uh, we are in the midst of a uh, uh, one of the greatest revolution of humankind. Yeah, the digitalization is uh, an extraordinary thing, and we are not understanding that from the cultural point of view. Yeah. Uh, 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 foreign and, and security uh, policy, uh, they are not normally at the top of the interest of our public opinions. Uh, 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 the reason behind the reasoning around uh, sovereignty is not on the core of our uh, policymakers, right? Uh, and so uh, there is also a cognitive issue. Artificial intelligence, 5G, all these new technologies are transforming the world. They are transformative technologies. And, and in the midst of... Hear me? Oh, you're back now, I think. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're just frozen for a second. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, so, in the midst of these uh, uh, new technologies, these new technologies will challenge our, uh, our ability to understand, our cognitive capabilities. Uh, think about the processes of artificial intelligence. They will be more and more impossible to understand because they will be uh, elaborating such a huge volume of data uh, uh, with algorithms that we barely understand, that uh, we will be facing a, a structural uh, surprise and a, a structural uh, uh, cognitive issue, right? So uh, uh, this perception, we, we are excused maybe if this perception is not that clear. Also because, let's face it, cyber is the domain of ambiguity. Uh, 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 in the cyber domain, um, it, it is impossible to understand and anticipate the motivation and the scope of a cyber campaign. Yeah? Uh, because you need to consider the strategy, the political, the operational context, you need to understand who is behind it, is it a state, is it a non-state. Uh, uh, normally intelligence community is very much involved with cyber because it's something very much connected to sovereignty. 
to power. And, and this is another reason why, for the public opinion, it is difficult to understand what goes on in cyber, because it's mostly intelligence, military stuff, yeah? many times. Or, or, or very technical stuff, which we normally don't understand, I certainly do not. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and this uh, sense of, of uh, this lack of awareness is really surprising and extraordinarily uh, dangerous. Why? And I conclude. Well, uh, uh, because cyber power is an essential component of sovereignty of the 21st century. Yeah? Uh, our freedom and our security will depend more and more on how free and how secure the Internet will be. Uh, um, uh, if uh, a different world is possible, it has to do with, how, with the battle uh, for a stable and, and, and just order in the cyber domain. Yeah? So these are huge political issues. Uh, uh, cyber is a new policy and security area. Uh, and what is really surprising and damaging is that politics is not taking care of that. We are still not developing the tools, the instrument, the reasoning, the ideology, the vision, the political vision, the motivation, the stamina, the resourcing uh, to grasp uh, all these. Uh, basically, uh, it's like uh, we, uh, we find ourselves in a situation in which we still need, uh, if I may say so, to rewrite uh, uh, the uh, George Kennan X telegram of the beginning of the Cold War, right? We need to understand, uh, uh, develop a comprehensive understanding of how the technology, uh, uh, the ongoing confrontation in cyberspace uh, impacts international stability and links together the political, the military, the economic, the social, the so sociological spheres. And we need to uh, reconceptualize all these. And, 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 and honestly, we're just at the beginning. And once again, this is why at, 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 at uh, the uh, Italian Institute for International Political Studies, we created the Center for Cybersecurity just to investigate better this dimension and, uh, and see how we can inject order in, uh, into this and assess better uh, how these dynamics impact international security. Um, the question is sort of how far can technical standards help us here? Uh, and I think we can see sort of two potential mechanisms uh, when, 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 we th when we think of cybersecurity. I think we can see two potential mechanisms here. First, I think, and most fundamentally, technical standards, uh, whatever, I mean, if, if we talk about a certain technology, of course, you have standardized and non-standardized components. Uh, and those that are standardized are certainly much more transparent and much more uh, subject to international scrutiny and investigation. So, um, say, if Huawei brings a technology to the negotiations at the third generation partnership project, uh, then, of course, their uh, Western companies, Western experts will have access to review uh, that technological solution. At the same time, of course, the 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 5G component or uh, is not entirely standardized. So, and uh, it would also be mistaken to think that technical standards uh, could be sort of uh, include the entire technology. I mean, this is this is too complex. Also, needs too many updates. They, this is this. Uh, so, so technical standards can't walk us all the way through, but technical standardization is sort of, I don't know, a ba let, let's call it a basis um, that uh, provides a bit more transparency and thereby could inject uh, a certain level of security. However, in those cases where maybe a technical standard becomes very complex, where a uh, few people uh, uh, actually really understand that technical standard, a technical standard can also internationalize or globalize a cybersecurity threat, a vulnerability. So uh, if, a, a if a vulnerability is not detected in a technical standard uh, and it's adopted as an international one, then this will be applied globally. Um, so, and in, 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 in we have seen attempts primarily also from um, 
from uh, security agencies, public security agencies, by the way, uh, we know it also from the US, from the NSA, to aim for exactly that, to, to aim to uh, include vulnerabilities in systems, so in, in technical standards, so to make sure they have access to data. And I mean, I would assume that there are quite a number of attempts that we are not aware of uh, until today, so probably also Chinese attempts. In that regard, I think technical standards are a dual, a, a, a double-edged sword here, certainly, uh, and also I'd, I'd argue that um, they can solve the issues uh, that Fabio has just described. I mean, they can be one piece uh, to the puzzle uh, in the sense that they provide some transparency in parts of that process, but uh, plenty of more is necessary that I think Fabio has touched upon in his excellent remarks. Thank you. Um, uh, so, if I may, oh, sorry, you want, uh, yes, I, of I, course. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry. I, I Go completely for it. agree with him. Uh, I, I think he has a very, very valid point. Uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, if it is true uh, that, great power, that the, the emerging uh, paradigm, the re-emerging paradigm of great power competition finds uh, uh, in the technological superiority uh, uh, and in the confrontation in cyberspace, uh, one of the uh, greatest quests, one of the greatest battles, yeah? the, the, the quest for technological superiority has, because how, uh, because how warfare will develop in the coming year with automation, with hyper war, with algorithmic warfare, uh, technological superiority will be an essential component of how able we are to defend and promote uh, our values, because as Tim said, uh, technology is not value free. Uh, if this is the paradigm, what we are looking at, uh, what it is developing, what we shall be concerned about uh, is the decoupling of the ITC, ICT supply chain at the global level. Uh, uh, we are witnessing uh, more and more uh, the issue of, uh, um, uh, how can I say, uh, strategic autonomy. This has been a debate very interesting in, in, in European Union, for instance, right? Uh, uh, the necessity to be self-sufficient, autarkic, uh, to be able to uh, to operate at the cyber uh, in the cyber domain uh, and to to achieve technological superiority without depending on others, right? Now, uh, this is developing also uh, a limitation to export, uh, so export control uh, on all dual issues, uh, on all technologies, on hardware and software, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, this is also the, uh, uh, creating a fragmentation of the internet, a balkanization of the global internet. You know that uh, China has created the, the Great Firewall, you know that Russia created its own uh, internet, which can be disconnected in case of crisis, right? Because uh, or what we were saying before, before of cyber enabled information warfare because of uh, uh, sabotage, because uh, of espionage. Now, uh, uh, this is also determining a, a, a normative patchwork which is developing at the global world, right? Uh, uh, and I'm sure Tim agrees with me when I say that uh, this normative patchwork uh, will create uh, 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 in itself, a stumbling block to a further uh, understanding at the global level. Yeah, that these uh, in, uh, in closed internet uh, that would uh, develop uh, will exacerbate uh, a polarization of the public debate, of the global debate. Uh, it will uh, create more difficulties uh, at the human level to understand each other. Right? We will all be a little bit more brainwashed, if I may say so. Now, if that's true. Uh, of course, uh, we, we need to understand that standards, uh, in fact, uh, in this perspective and without wanting in any, in any way to contradict him, which I, with which I, I totally agree, but in this perspective, uh, standardization is uh, a, a, new a, new, a new confrontation taking place, uh, which, uh, which goes hand in hand uh, uh, with the quest for technological superiority and, and with the uh, 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 objective of a, of a great power competition, which definitely at the end is always that of uh, imposing uh, our own rule-based international order, uh, uh, re, uh, rethinking the order if you are a revisionist power as China is, right? Thank you.
I, I am very skeptical and pessimist, to be, to be quite honest. Um, uh, once again, I, for all those like me, but many other people that believe that a different world is possible uh, uh, and that must be possible, uh, certainly this uh, debate uh, is central. Uh, Teresa, uh, it, it is essential to understand how we can uh, uh, revert the paradigm. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, as far as I can see, uh, uh, the great power competition is uh, forcefully re-emerging uh, and uh, technological superiority is an essential component of that. Uh, cyber power in a, is an essential component uh, of sovereignty in the 21st century and we are witnessing a, a huge security paradox mounting. What is a security paradox? And then I leave the word uh, to, to Tim, uh, uh, if he, the, the floor to Tim if he wants. Uh, a security paradox is a situation in which uh, uh, my security, the, the more one actor seeks security, the more the whole system becomes unsecure. Yeah? Uh, and in cyber, it, this is what's happening. Uh, uh, we are in a paradigm of zero-sum game, uh, uh, my security uh, always goes at the expense uh, uh, of your uh, security, unfortunately. And this is um, the paradigm that we are witnessing, and therefore I am skeptical about the fact that we will be able to revert. What is the solution? Uh, the solution is that of effective multilateralism, is that of respecting differences and trying, uh, as we did for many years uh, in the Westphalian society, to, to, to come up with diplomatic, multilateral, multi stakeholder solutions. Uh, uh, we need to keep the Obesian state uh, uh, in its niche where it belongs uh, and not allow him uh, to rule uh, the world. Yeah, I'd like to add on that. I mean, no, again, this is not a controversy we're having this morning. Uh, we, we really agree on, on plenty, but just maybe to add um, four quick points. The first being, I mean, there there is no full security. I mean, we uh, if if the aim is to reach a hundred percent security, then we'll certainly never reach it. This is this is for sure. My second point is, if we as social scientists believe that maybe there's a technical way out, then I must uh, also um, uh, say it, it, it's not. I mean. In the end, if you want to build in a technical backdoor into a complex system uh, of whatever kind we're talking about, let's say 5G, let's say uh, a smart city, whatever, it will always be possible. So we do need a certain level of trust here. And the, quest the question is, how do we get to trustworthiness? Of course, we can increase technological security. And I'm not saying it's not worth doing it. Of course, we should do it. But uh, a certain level of trust is necessary uh, as well. And the quest is how can we sort of raise both technological security, but also levels of trustworthiness. Uh, and this is why I think that uh, also, and that's my third point, national solutions, Teresa, you asked for national solutions. I don't think there's national solutions. An interconnected world, uh, I mean, what should Germany, what should Switzerland really do to solve this? And here I actually I actually uh, fully agree with Fabio. I mean, after all, it will be a difficult way. I don't have the solution here, but it must be multilateral. It must be international, global, um, at least regional. Uh, and I think that, that this fact of trustworthiness and that it's so hard to overcome will to some extent indeed sort of lead to uh, different technological spheres. The question is uh, not do we see uh, a, a Western sphere and a Chinese sphere. The question uh, to me is more sort of what extent, uh, sort of to what extent will we be distinct and to what extent will we still uh, share common technological commonalities here. And fourth and finally, maybe more specifically on standards, I fully agree that standard setting has developed into a competitive arena uh, in the quest for technological superiority. Totally agree with that. The thing for technical standards, and I think this illustrates very much this question of degree, is a technical standard is only good if it's widely accepted. 
I mean, if I establish my technical standard sitting here in Berlin and no one else is going to adopt it, that standard is worth nothing. So at least they need to convince others. So, so standard setting to some extent is a consensus building process. Uh, and I think therefore, I guess the technical standards uh, setting may be an arena that is not the most confrontational, but also a very interesting one because you have really both dynamics at play where you can uh, not understand the full picture, but it's one interesting angle to understand indeed sort of to what extent will it be consensus driven and to what extent will it be competitive? So, so what's the degree of fragmentation we are going to see? All right, thank you. Um, would you like to follow up on that, Fabio, or otherwise I would ask the next question? No, no, uh, I, I now work at NATO, uh, uh, which is maybe a peculiar kind of multilateral. Uh, it's actually multinational more than multilateral. But anyway, um, uh, NATO developed this initiative, which is called Diana, which is an accelerator uh, for maintaining uh, the technological superiority within the West. Um, so we are actively involved, uh, if you will, uh, in uh, standardizing uh, cooperation. And so that's another interesting kind of standardization, if you will. Um, no, but jokes aside, I, I completely uh, concur with Tim. I, I, I believe that uh, 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 standards may certainly uh, provide homogeneity within the international community and uh, uh, provide maybe a technical way out for some very thorny uh, issues. Uh, but once again, uh, uh, I find it difficult to believe that we can uh, uh, achieve the consensus uh, at the global level uh, in the midst uh, of a competition which is more and more harsh, uh, more and more disruptive and potentially destructive as the cyber threat. Uh, and and uh, um, uh, but I, once again, concur with Tim when he says that it's an issue of trust. Uh, you mentioned it as well, Teresa. The, the, the idea that we shall develop confidence building measures in cyberspace is possibly one of the best uh, low hanging fruit uh, to develop and inject order within this troubled uh, international society. Uh, uh, is it working? Uh, well, if you look at the ransomware attacks, uh, the cyber supply, uh, the ICT supply chain attacks uh, that developed uh, in the last year, uh, we need to be pessimists, honestly. Artificial intelligence realm, uh, we say the principle is garbage in, garbage out. So uh, the, the quality of data is really essential, and this is actually mentioned at uh, discussing 5G and the Chinese uh, uh, technology, which, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the risk of simply providing good data uh, is in itself a strategic advantage, right? Um, so, but, but the point is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the artificial intelligence world uh, will be about uh, basically three things, uh, uh, meaning it will be about uh, data, connectivity and computing power. Uh, uh, attacks will all uh, uh, always arrive on, on the three layers, uh, on the connectivity, on the cloud, uh, on the processing power, quantum, uh, and on the data, which will be manipulated, which will be, uh, it's the new oil, we say, right? Uh, so uh, uh, it would be wonderful if we could ensure uh, 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 the confidentiality, the integrity and the availability of data. Uh, but unfortunately, my guess is that uh, this will be the first target uh, in, the, in the next confrontation among states and non-state actors. Yeah, again, I agree. Uh, I also, I mean, I've been talking primarily about technical standards, um, and of course, there are other standards in place. Technical standards, I'd always at least claim, uh, aim not to, to necessarily restrict uh, here uh, the availability of data, but provide sort of uh, 
uh, common frameworks uh, for um, yeah, all, all kind. I mean, flow of data, storage of data, collection of data, etc. So, so in that sense, um, the fact that we are going to have standards and 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 also improve security thereby doesn't necessarily need to be uh, to mean restrictions on on the availability and quality of data. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. And then the question is more sort of what are we in Europe or in the West sort of making out of this? But I don't quite see that's an like theoretically at least it's not a necessity that that's uh, hampering uh, or or usage and access to data. Yes, Fabio. Uh, if I can come back just very briefly uh, because listening to Tim, uh, I got an idea which I think is maybe interesting uh, to the discussion. Uh, 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 GRP. Uh, elaborated within the European Union, uh, also the NIS uh, directive, but most importantly, the GRPs uh, show that there is another kind of standardization that you may have, and that is the uh, leading by example standardization uh, effect. Uh, soft power uh, means uh, 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 convincing other uh, countries, other people, uh, that your system works better. Uh, attract uh, other systems by uh, leading and showing example. Uh, this is the fight that certainly the European Union uh, and, and the West, uh, uh, culturally speaking, should take, uh, should embrace uh, uh, to promote and try and inject uh, order. Because at the end of the day, it will be uh, up to our elite uh, to show autocratic regimes uh, that uh, we are better off. That democracy can win, that uh, uh, statalism, autarchism, uh, authoritarianism uh, simply are not the uh, best system in this global uh, competition for, for, for technical superiority. Uh, democracy is able to deliver uh, populations' uh, rights, uh, civil liberties are, at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters. <laughs> Sorry. No, but thank you very much. It's also nice that we were able to get a bit of a positive uh, statement there for the end as we finish our panel discussion. And I hope that taking away from this, we all strive to lead by good example. Thank you very much for joining us today.